On today's show, we'll break down the final 18 games of the Leafs regular season and ask ourselves which questions still need to be answered by the team down the stretch. You're listening to the Locked On Leafs podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team every day. Your Locked On Maple Leafs, your daily podcast on the Toronto Maple Leafs, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome into the Locked On at Leafs podcast, a daily Maple Leaf centered podcast hosted by myself, Mike DiStefano, and my co-host, Dave Morissuti. Today's episode is brought to you by Sleeper. Download the Sleeper app and use the promo code LOCKEDONNHL to get up to a $100 match on your first deposit. Terms and conditions apply. See Sleeper's terms of use for details. What's going on, Dave? How you feeling on this Tuesday? Not too bad, not too bad. Enjoying a little bit of a break from the games so that we could just talk about practice. Practice. What are you talking about practice for? Uh, yeah, yesterday's podcast, we did a little later in the day, so we're able to kind of get in, you know, the Monday practice report. Uh, so if you missed that, you can go back and check it out. But basically, the need to know is uh, Mitch Marner was not at practice. He is day-to-day and uh, is... I guess doubtful at this point to play Thursday when the Leafs return to the ice against the Philadelphia Flyers. Jake McCabe was also absent from practice, but that was uh, considered more of a maintenance day type of thing. Outside of that, not a whole lot newness uh, that we learned from practice on Monday. Speaking of uh, what we learned, I, I I thought that today would be a really good time since it's it's like kind of right smack dab in the middle of this four or five day stretch where we have no games for the Maple Leafs and you know there it's it's now post trade deadline and now there's still some questions that need to be answered and there's 18 games to go. So um, what I thought we could do here, Dave, is you know kind of. It break down the schedule for what the final 18 games entail, who they play, how many games, where they sit in the playoff run. And then what answers do we still need from this group going forward through the final 18 games? So I think that's what we'll focus on uh, today. I'm looking forward to it. First and foremost, let's break down what the schedule looks like for the Maple Leafs, uh, you know, the rest of the way. So, through 64 games, you know, the, the Leafs, they have 82 points this year, which is good for third in the division, Dave. They're sitting nine points back of Boston with three games in hand and 10 points back of Florida with just one game in hand on them. And then when you look at the teams that are chasing them, they've got an eight-point lead on the Tampa Bay Lightning, and they also still have a game in hand on Tampa. And then they've got a 10-point lead up on the Detroit Red Wings, um, they have the same amount of games played there. So I don't know about you, Dave. I think the Leafs at this point are pretty well solidified in that third position in this Atlantic division race. And I guess the, the lone question that we have now going forward is who are they going to play in round one? Because we probably going to end up being on the road. Is it going to be Boston or is it going to be Florida? Uh, that's probably all we need to know because I think third place is pretty well locked up here. Uh, I would say so. Uh, nine points behind the Bruins. Yeah, the Leafs have three games in hand, but they also lost a big advantage when they didn't beat Boston yes. uh, this past week. And Boston's one point behind the Panthers. Again, the Panthers owning the better points percentage because they have two games in hand. But yeah, it's going to be that that first, second spot likely going to be something that we'll watch from now until the end of the year. I think also Boston lost pretty badly to St. Louis 5-1. So yeah, 5-1 I think I saw. It's good yeah. to see that you know teams can beat Boston. <laughs> Just it would be nice if it was a different blue team beating the Bruins, but we digress. Yes, very true. For those who missed it on on YouTube uh, or who were listening the audio form, I I give a little fist pump when uh when I heard the score of the, the St. Louis Blues versus the Boston Bruins game, a rematch of the Stanley Cup final from not too mm. long ago. Um, so, yeah, I think that's pretty much established. The Leafs know where they're going to start. Um, they're they're going to start on the road in round one, most likely. Just who is it going to be against, Boston or Florida? That 
is still to be determined. But what do the final 18 games look like for the Toronto Maple Leafs? Well, Dave, um, glad you asked. Uh, you didn't ask, but I'm going to tell you anyway. And I think <laughs> the people will be interested. In terms of uh, their strength of schedule, they actually still do have a pretty pretty tough schedule the rest of the way. They've got the eighth hardest schedule this uh, for the final 18 games with their opponents having an average win percentage of 572. They've got three games against the Devils, two games against Florida, two games against Carolina, two games against Philly, two against Tampa, two against Washington, one against Montreal, one against Pittsburgh, Buffalo, Edmonton, and Detroit. They also all play uh, one time. So there's some pretty good teams in uh, in you know in that little mix there down the stretch. Like Carolina is going to be a tough out. We know that's going to be the case. Edmonton's going to be a tough game. Florida, obviously, they're one of the top teams in the NHL. And then Philly's been uh, a tough team to to put away. And, I mean, Buffalo always gives Toronto a run for their money. And I'm still not sleeping on the Devils, you know, as, as just a team that's going to be a hard out as long as they have a, a guy by the name of Jack Hughes on their squad. guess I could say the same thing about Pittsburgh, who has Sidney Crosby. Uh, so pretty tough skit. Uh, in the final 18 games, some good opponents where the Leafs can can glean, uh, you know, something out of those games, I would think. Yeah, I mean, th- this last stretch here, when you look at like some of the teams that they play, you know, it- it's a decent mix. Not, I'm not going to lie, but like there are also some easy games. And you kind of hope that the Leafs don't take those. Ga- I know that I'm worried that because the Leafs position is set, there might be a little bit of complacency, right? Because last year we knew it was Tampa Toronto round one. Yeah. So we were worried that there was going to be a little bit of complacency there. Now I'm a little concerned that this could happen again. And look, yeah, Tampa, they're going to be fighting for their playoff lives. Detroit, they're going to be playing for their playoff lives. Maybe I don't know, actually the Washington is Washington like fully out of it. They're, I guess. Yeah. No, they're in there. They're in there. They're, they're still, definitely in the mix. Still kick it around. So like, I guess maybe that's something the Leafs have going for them. But other than that, it's like, eh, I, I get a little concerned that that could happen down the stretch here with this team. If they got I mean, a little too could. complacent. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it could, you could say the same thing about a lot of other teams out there oh, that yeah. are, you know, solidified into, into some spots, but you would hope that, you know, some personal pride and some personal records could be, you know, had for the Maple Leafs. Like, you know, Austin Matthews still wants to chase down that, you know, can he, can he get to 70? That was such that was a, a talking point that we had for so long, you know, can, can the motivation to try and get there, you know, give him that motivation in that final 18 game. So he doesn't get complacent. What about Nylander? He's got 84 points, you know, can, can he get himself another 16 points over this 18 game stretch to get himself to a hundred points on the season who expected a hundred point year for William Nylander, not me, but you know, he's, he's got a chance to do it. You would think that might add some motivation for him. So you know, there's a couple of guys out here who definitely, I think uh, could be motivated by their point totals. And just for the fact that, well, they haven't necessarily won anything and don't take your foot off the pedal. Cause it's tough to, to get back as they've seen in the playoffs. Um, so hopefully that's not the case, but you're right. It, it always is a little bit of a concern, especially when you know exactly where you're going to end up, uh, you know, most most likely. And that's going to end up being third spot in the Atlantic. Uh, in terms of uh, what, how many, uh, you know, back-to-backs they still have, there's still actually three back-to-backs to play out this year. They've got two next week, which is wild. Uh, yeah, so two next week. On was it Wednesday, Thursday, and then uh, Saturday, Sunday, or no? Tuesday, Wednesday, and then Friday, Saturday. You might have to look that up. And then they end on the back to back as well, uh, playing Florida and Tampa on the final two days of the league year. So, still three back to backs to go for the Toronto yeah. Maple Leafs over the course of this 18 game stretch. Yeah, Tuesday, Wednesday, then Saturday, Sunday. Yeah. Okay. Good old six o'clock start on a Sunday. Six o'clock start on a Sunday. Yeah. Really? Ooh, nice. In Carolina. Uh, I don't hate that. I don't hate that. Gotta be honest with you. As long as there's no football going on at six o'clock anymore, which there isn't, I don't mind a six PM start on a Sunday. I don't mind I don't hate it. 
I don't. I I, I have. I watched uh, a few of, like this afternoon NHL games on the weekend. Like it's great. Like that's when you want to get people. Like pe- some people don't have lives on a Saturday Sunday. I'll watch some hockey. Yeah, Do man. It. I mean, like y- you watch yourself a nice three p.m. or one p.m. game on a on a Sunday. I mean, football has proven that. People like to watch sports Sunday afternoon. You know what I mean? Even if you're a church goer, you go to church, you come home, you throw on the game, and then by the time it's over, it's time for dinner. You break bread with the family, and then you've got the whole night to enjoy yourself, get yourself ready, do some chores, do what you got to do. So uh, 6 p.m. is better than 7 p.m., but, hey, I wouldn't hate, you know, all 3, 2, 1 p.m. puck drop action at some point, but uh, – yeah, we don't get those with the Maple Leafs. They they like to put those things in prime time, unfortunately. Uh, all right. Why don't we take a quick break? When we come back, we both have questions that we still need answered by this Toronto Maple Leafs team. We will uh, tell each other what those questions are and, and, and you know, just kind of talk about them. So we'll do that on the other side. I'm Mike DiStefano with Dave Morissuti. You're listening to the Locked On Leafs podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team. Every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Sleeper. It's almost the halfway point in the season, Lee fans. And regardless of where you are in the current standings, I want to remind you that you could win big by playing daily fantasy hockey on Sleeper. It's the official daily fantasy app of the Locked On NHL Network. Sleeper is our number one choice for daily fantasy sports, and especially daily fantasy hockey. Because with Sleeper, you can win 100 times your cash in daily fantasy hockey. Hockey contests. All you got to do is pick whether studs like Crosby or McDavid, McKinnon, Matthews, Nylander, Tavares, whoever will record more or less than their sleeper projections for things like goals, assists, saves, plus, minus, and more in any given game. And to win 100 times your bet on sleeper, you need to correctly predict the outcome of eight player stats. You heard me, Leaf fans. You can win 100 times your money by playing daily fantasy hockey with sleepers. So start paying attention and nailing your picks so you can start winning big. Use the promo code locked on NHL and you'll get up to a $100 match on your first deposit. Terms and conditions apply. That's code locked on NHL. Sleep sleep returns of use for details and locational availability. Welcome back into the Locked On Leafs podcast. Spike DiStefano and Dave Borisuti. We are a daily Maple Leaf centric podcast. We got new episodes coming at you each and every weekday, Monday through Friday. Whichever platform you get your podcast from, where that's audio, you could also catch it on YouTube for the video format of the podcast. And just a reminder, we are still on our road to 5K subscribers on YouTube. We're so, so close. I think we've gotten under the 250 now, like 240, 245, something in that range. So we're close. Once we get to 5K, we're giving away a Leaf jersey. So if you want to yourself or want a chance at that jersey, got to be one of our 5,000 subscribers. And then uh, once it happens, we'll come up with a, a fun little contest to for one of you guys to to win a new jersey. We're hoping it's before the playoffs, so you got something to, to sport throughout the playoffs brand new jersey from our, your friends from locked on leafs wouldn't that be nice i think it would be uh so sub up and we'd be greatly uh appreciative of that all right dave 18 games to go 18 games remaining what are some of the questions that you still have that you think need to be answered down the stretch here in these final 18 games give me the first question you have and then we'll kind of Go back and forth. All right. My first one here is, will Sheldon Keefe, or actually, will Timothy Lilligren earn Sheldon Keefe's trust to play in the playoffs? Oof. Interesting. Interesting. And it's a very valid question because I think right now (laughs) you would probably say no, right? Like last two years, he sat up on the press box for game one. And this year, you you know, you think about what do they want? They want size. They want guys who can, you know, push dudes out in front of the net and protect the cage. Well, Lilligren doesn't necessarily do that. And I don't know if you heard the comments before the game on Saturday when Keefe was asked, you know, who was coming out. And he said it killed me not to have Benoit in there. Well, I think that's because if push comes to shove, if it were a, a do or die game, he would have Benoit in there over Lilligren. 
But right now he's got to see what he has and can he trust Timothy Lilligren and, and, you know, can Joel Edmondson be a partner that works with him and maybe Edmondson could be that guy who clears the net and that frees up Lilligren to, you know, move the puck a little bit more. So perhaps, you know, it could still happen, uh, but certainly it, it, it's something we need to know and find out come game one. And, and, you know, that's similar to what I had as one of my uh, questions. And it was, you know, how will the D pairing shake out? What will they look like? You know, what turns out to be the most successful option uh, that Keith will have trust and faith that it'll work come game one? You know, that was kind of one of my questions. So they're very similar. And ultimately, it, it does stem from, will Lilligren be part of it? Will he gain the trust from Sheldon Keith? to be part of the game one D pairings. Yeah. I think like the big one here, you constantly hear Keith say, we want to get that right shot. We want to get his right shot in the, in the lineup. Then you should have traded for a right shot defenseman, not Joel Edmondson. But they anyway. tried. They just couldn't afford it. We're not getting into that conversation. No, but <laughs> I think like the big one here is should have given it the I, first round pick for Chris Tanev. Okay. Now I'm done. Continue. <laughs> I, that's the thing here. It, you, I think they see that Lilligren, when he plays to his potential, there's upside to his game. Because as much as we need that steady defensive presence on the back end, you also need guys that are willing to do the bring the, something a little extra come playoff time. The reason why I was so big on Morgan Raleigh's play in the playoffs, he was making game changing plays, right? Scoring scoring goals doing things like that you still need yes your defensemen need to rely on their play in their own zone first i get that but the good teams also have defensemen contributing on the other side on both sides i think that's what they also see in timothy Logren. he can do that it's just he needs to focus on the important part of the game and that's in his own end i think we've seen we've seen periods of it it's just when when he faces a certain opponent, and one of the Leafs are probably going to face in round one, it has hasn't been there. No, it it looked awful last week in both of the games against the Boston Bruins, who is statistically the most likely opponent that the Maple Leafs will face come round one of the playoffs. So, yeah, it's he's definitely going to be someone who's going to be circled, and there's going to be a magnifying glass on him going forward to. It's not even like, okay, you know, how's he playing? What's his skill level like? Is he big? It's, is there jam? Is there toughness? Is he trying to box guys out? Like, I want to see a willingness of him doing these things and some succession as well, obviously, to, to go along with it. So that's kind of what I think, uh, yeah, is what we're going to be watching and, and seeing if he can answer that question in the final 18 games. All right, next question that I have, Dave, and look, it's a pretty basic one, but you know, who's going to be this team's starting goaltender come game one of the playoffs? Is it going to be Joseph Wall or is it going to be Ilya Samsonov? Like, I, 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 you could probably argue either way. As of this second, I, I might say that Samsonov has the the slight nod over Wall right now, but there's definitely still going to be a competition, and, and there's still tons of games for both of these guys to grab that net. So who is going to be that game one starter? I think that's something that we'll learn over the next 18 games. I think, I mean, we had a little bit of that conversation on the last episode, but I think when I look at what Samsonov has done, I, I think he's played as well as I think you could expect given what he went through this year. And I think that emotional impact has kind of lifted him in a way, given him a little bit of a boost. To me, what I still... I'm always concerned about is when things start to go wrong for him, his ability to bounce back and play just a calming style. I just find Joseph Wall gives me more assurance as a more calm demeanor in the net. The issue is the two games he's been back for have probably been one of the probably been the worst efforts I've seen from the Leafs. I think it was, it's a little unfair if those are saying, well, I can now we don't like Joseph Wall shouldn't be in the playoffs. I want to like I want to see him get no, nah, I don't want to see him get thrown terrible opponents. I want to see what happens when this team is playing better in front of him. Because to me, 
and I haven't del- dived deep enough into the numbers, but it seems like the Leafs play way differently sometimes in front of Joseph Bolden than they do Elias Samsonov. S- sorry, were you saying you want to see Samsonov playing against some better opponents or Wall playing Wall, against worse opponents? I, I want to see Wall playing against when this team is playing better, right? Like, Give him see, see I I would prefer to see Samsonov against some better opponents as because like yeah here's the thing like if if Wool like if the Leafs aren't playing well and we we know this to be the case usually your goalie needs to steal you at least one game in the playoffs mm-hmm. right and if you're an underdog maybe even two so if Joseph Wall can't win you games that your team doesn't have it like maybe he's not the guy you know what I mean. So, so I don't necessarily think by throwing wool out there against lower tier talent, lower tier teams, if that's going to show me anything, I think maybe, okay, wool didn't play well and, and was unable to, to shut the door when the Leafs were getting their doors blown off, couldn't keep us in the game. Well, let's see if Samsonov can keep us in some of these games. So I think maybe Samsonov gets that, right. you know, uh, uh, plays against Florida. Uh, Samsonov maybe gets, you know, uh, uh, the game, against Carolina on Saturday. Um, you know, I guess those are kind of, they got two against Florida, two against Carolina and two against Philly, Tampa, you know, like those teams. There's that an Edmonton are, in there as well. Edmonton is in there as well. So it's like, okay, what, what can the goaltenders do in those games? Like the games against, I don't know, Washington or Pittsburgh, Montreal, like Buffalo, those aren't going to tell me a whole lot. You know what yeah. I mean? I want to see them against the good opponents and how they fare in those games. I think that'll be far more telling than uh, how do they look in front of a good Leafs team? Well, they'll look fine, right? But how do they look in front of a team that's poor? Can they steal games and make big saves? True. That's what I want to know. Yeah, and like we've I've we've seen that from both goaltenders this year. Like I remember Joseph Wall against like the Stars, who are a good team. Leafs did not play well, and he stole them a game. Yeah. Before his injury, he stole a few games. Absolutely. Yeah. He's capable of doing it. I just want to see it post-injury. Right. You know, I I, I just, course. I've seen it out of Samsonov recently, where it's not that he's stolen games, but he's made some good saves at at, at timely, you know, timely mm-hmm. manner, timely saves. So, uh, but again, 18 more games to decide who gets that net come game one. Um, do you have a lean? Really quick before we move on. Right now, I'll lean Samsonov. Yeah, same. I think the experience is something that will always trump things as well. If there's any, if like if there was any time you were like 50 50, vet, what did is, what is Mike Babcock used to say? Go, tie goes to the veteran. Yeah. Yeah. Still, I think holds true in a lot of ways. I think it, coaches are like that in a lot of ways. Sammy out dueled Vasilevsky last year in the playoffs. We saw it happen. Yep. Maybe he can out-duel Swayman or Walmart or Bobrovsky. Who knows? We'll see. All right. Um, I've got a couple more questions. I know you got a couple more questions, but let's uh, let's take a break and come back and get to the remaining cues we have about the final 18 games for the Maple Leafs here down the stretch, and we'll do that next. Today's show is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. What brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors is everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance from superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride or die every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the price you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply, eBay guaranteed fit, only available to U.S. customers. Welcome back, kids, to the Locked On Leafs podcast. It's Mike DiStefano and Dave Morissuti. It's an off day, and they have an off week, really. They've got, what, a five-day stretch in between uh, games. Their final one was on Saturday, W, against the ooh, Montreal Canadiens, and then they don't play until Thursday when they play the Philadelphia Flyers. So long stretch in between games, and, you know, I guess it, it, it's, it's perfect timing considering this is, quote-unquote, 
the final stretch of the season. So we figured we kind of break things down and see, all right, it's the final stretch. The trade deadline's behind us. What questions do we still need answered in these final 18? So we already went through a couple, um, and we've got a couple more lined up that we want to talk about that we feel need to be answered over the next uh, six weeks. So, Dave, what's another one you got? Mine is, is Sheldon Keith done tinkering with this lineup? How many more changes should we expect, drastic changes, I should say, between now and the playoffs? How many do you think? I know the Marner injury changed the lineup in a in a in a big way. We were going to expect a change. Uh, I didn't expect the full some having Bertuzzi up in the top six, uh, in the top line and d- Nyes down to the third let me, line. Let me ask you this. Let me ask you this because I think it, it pretty much comes down to to one thing. And again, it's another question that I kind of had, so we could talk about it. Um, because yes, the Marner obviously when Marner's out, that's going to yeah. change everything. But we don't expect these lines to to remain. I think the big question that needs to be answered between now and game 82 is, is Domi your number two center or do you have to go back to Tavares? That's to me is kind of the big question that needs to be answered over the last few weeks here. No, I think so. That's the only like massive change you're going to make to your lineup is either Domi stays there at two C or Tavares slides back up into that position. I, I do think we're going to see two more. I think you're going to see a couple of times where they go back to that Domi at 2C just to try it again. And then I think they're, I think it's going to get to the point where I think probably officially settle on Tavares being moved back up. I just don't know if Domi has defensive acumen to play to second line center. So I think he's going to try it one more time. But I think ultimately, I think John Tavares is going to reclaim that second line center role it's it's real interesting and it's such a conundrum to be in if you're the maple Leafs because Tavares and William Nylander and this has happened every year for the last three years like eventually they get to a point where it just doesn't work anymore and Mm -hmm. that's where the Leafs were uh where both of those guys weren't I mean Tavares went what like three months without a, a goal at five on five or one goal at five on five. Like it, it was insane. Like something about like 26 games or something like that. It was wild. How, uh, how long it took for this guy to get, to get going at five on five. And it wasn't until he dropped to, to three C where it really started to get going. What I kind of like about it though, with having Domi on, on the second line, Tavares on the third line is it just spreads out scoring, right? Yeah. I think you, you've seen an influx of secondary scoring once those changes were made, right? You saw Bobby McMahon start to get on the board. You saw Tyler Bertuzzi start to score some goals. Max Domi has scored some goals of late. Yarn Crock is getting some opportunities. You know, you're seeing guys who weren't scoring earlier, and this team suffered from a lack of goal scoring. Um, and they did start to get some offense by just, you know, putting some more talent lower in the lineup and just it it just you know improves everyone else improves the line as a whole um so the question i think is is like can you live with the bad of this second line and the defensive issues that it might have um if it gives you enough secondary offense like that's ultimately what sheldon keith is going to be weighing in his head right can you live with the good or can you live with the bad because the good is better than the bad I think the one way they could help help in that regard is to do what Keith has always done when a team when this team needs help defensively, just throw Cal Yonkrook on there. Well, who are uh, you with putting Domi, with Domi? Where are you throwing him? If you're doing Domi second line, I think you have to have Cal Yonkrook up there. So where you're putting Bertuzzi on the third line? I think you're gonna I think they're gonna keep Bertuzzi on that first line. I think they're Ooh. gonna keep Matthew Nyes on the third line. Interesting. Okay. I, like to me, I think they don't want to drop Bertuzzi into the third on on the third line. Otherwise, he would have done it on Saturday. Yeah. No, I mean, I agree. I suppose. Yeah, it does make right. some sense. It, it's so like Nyes, a... Domi, or Nyes, Tavares, and McMahon. McMahon. Yeah. Yeah. It could possibly work. I don't hate that, right? Like, now you they again. It, I don't. 
I just don't think you can have a line of Doby, Bertuzzi, and Nylander. I think that's too volatile of a line to throw out there. It just hasn't worked offensively. Yeah. All right. Interesting. That is something that we're going to have to find out moving yeah. forward. Um, here's one that I've got for you. And I guess, you know, this will just organically come and, and we'll have that answer. Uh, will the newcomers truly help upgrade the Leafs 22nd ranked penalty kill? Uh, that's why they were brought in here, right? Connor Dewar, Joel Edmondson, Ilya Labushkin, all three of those players will get uh, will get an opportunity to, to kill some penalties. And hopefully it it helps this team because they desperately need it. Special teams is so important come playoff time. We know that they've got an elite power play. And, and when that thing gets cooking, it's, it's tough to stop. But can they stop the bleeding when it comes to allowing goals uh, shorthanded? Because they've they've given up way too many goals uh, on the power play. They what seventy just a seventy seven percent kill rate. Like I said, ranked twenty second in the NHL, and I believe that is the worst PK among all playoff teams at this point. Um, so will these newcomers address that problem? Right. Like that's why they were brought in to help the penalty kill. You heard Sheldon talk about that. You heard um, Brad Trulieving talk about that. So, you know, it's time to put your money where your mouth is. And hopefully these guys can come in and really get this PK cooking because that's going to be huge for the team going forward. And they got about 18 games to, to gain chemistry and show us that they could be trusted in a five on four uh, situation. Well, there's two things about it. You can bring in different personnel, but are they going to play? Is is the style of this PK going to work for them too, right? Like there's times where they bring in guys, but there's still that, you know, those times where there's a guy left in front of the net behind the PK because the guys are, the defenders are a little bit further up and not right where the goalie is, right? Like stylistically, will that PK be good enough? That's always what I think is like coaching plays a part of it, but also let's make, make sure Joel Edmondson isn't trying to play for the other team on the penalty kill too. I'm going to, that joke's not going to end for me. He, I'm going to keep bringing up that he almost scored on the Leafs in his debut. That would have never gone over. That would have stuck around for a little bit in the bell center at that. Yeah. There would have been lots of jokes, lots yeah. of jokes inside man, Joel Edmondson. Yeah playing double agent for the Habs. <laughs> I think what it also comes down to is, you know, how much are we going to see Nylander on the penalty kill, right? Because Sean Keith liked put, doing that, right? We haven't seen as much Austin Matthews on the penalty kill and more Nylander, which I find I found interesting. Um, but yeah, I think it all depends on how much Sheldon Keith wants to put those new guys. Like, he'll put Joel Edmondson out there for sure. Connor Dewar, I mean, that's those those are the minutes you brought him in for. It's the other guys like a Nylander, Matthews, or whoever else. But I think are, you bring you bring in a doer so that you don't have to play those guys that often. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I I mean, allow them to get that extra, you know, sixty to ninety seconds of rest every game by allowing them to sit on the bench and just recuperate, and then just mm -hmm. let them unleash at five on five. You know, like I, I think that'll serve the team a lot better um, than having them have to play special teams and play uh, on the penalty kill. Like, let, let these other dudes do that. Guys who are also very willing to be physical, guys who are willing to to block shots. You know, I, I know they want to get a little bit of offense off of this uh, penalty kill, but Connor Dewar's got three shorthanded goals this year. He might be able to provide some of that. You know, so uh, yeah. it'll be interesting to see how Sheldon Keefe deploys this uh, this penalty kill now with the, the new players and, and what that means for the old guys and how time sets up. Again, something we've got 18 games to learn. Uh, you got another one quickly? Uh, my final one is what's what's going to happen with Nick Robertson? Mm hmm. Yeah. He made yeah, it known he wasn't happy about being sent down. I mean, no one's ever going to be happy about being sent from the NHL to the AHL. But where is his? Where is his? Where is his role? That's what. I, that's that's what I mean. Like, yeah, he's yeah. not happy, but like, dude, you made yourself expendable. 
Like you stop scoring goals and this is what happens. Is that that's what you are. You're supposed to be a goal scorer for this team. Like you're you're not a great two-way talent. Like sorry to tell you, you know, you're not a defensive aficionado. So if you're not scoring goals, you're really not providing a whole lot for this team. And it's not like he can go out there and kill penalties either. So your role on this team is is very much up in the air, which is why I thought they were going to trade him, to be honest with you, at the deadline. It just did not happen. I thought perhaps is there another right-handed defenseman that's in the same you know spot as Nick Robertson? You know, Eric Brandstrom's name got brought up a couple of times as possibly being available by Ottawa. Thought maybe that could have been something, but uh didn't happen, obviously. But yeah, I, I also question that. Like, where's the fit? What 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 will Nick Robertson uh, is he a part of this team moving forward? Uh, is there a fit here? Like what, what's going to happen with Nick Robertson? I had the same question uh, myself, but we'll see. I guess the last question that I have is pretty, pretty blunt. Is it still possible for Matthews to get to 70, Dave? I mean, he scores a couple of hat tricks in the next couple of weeks. Maybe it, it gets a little more interesting. 18 I, I, games, he needs 16 more goals. Man, he is he totally does. capable of doing it, but I told I I think he'll I think I think for me get past 65. I think like 65 definitely doable. That's what he needs 10 more, 11 more. To get 11. To I like that for like for me, 65, and I'll be happy with that. 70 would have been awesome. But he, he's gonna have to really have to pick it up. I know he's got there's a couple of games like against I mean he just had a game against Montreal. He didn't score. Like to me, it's like he it's up to him to pick it up. Maybe this break will help him get kind I'm of hoping so. I'm hoping so because he, he did he score a hatch against the Flyers the last time we played them. True, very true. He he just he hasn't looked explosive over mm-hmm. the last couple of games. Um so I am hoping, like ever since the flu bug hit the room, he really just hasn't looked great. He's looked a little sluggish. So I'm I'm hoping that this five day uh, layoff allows him to, you know, re- regroup and and get going for this final eighteen, and he can get back to scoring a goal every night. It seemed like, and couple of couple of multi goal games, you know, right at the gate. Then it's back in play, I guess. I mean, 16 goals in 18 games is tough. It's it's going to be tough. I think now you could probably um, probably got to set the bar at 65. I think you're right. Like 70 is a little bit of a stretch at this point now. Uh, but I think 65 still very attainable and still an outstanding season. Like, we have what, one 65 goal scorer in the 21st century? Like, it just doesn't happen, yeah. you know? Doesn't happen, so... Uh, I think even if he gets there, Leafs Nation needs to be ecstatic about that number. Um, but yeah, so the, those are the questions that we still have going forward that we hope to be answered in the final 18 games of the regular season for the Toronto Maple Leafs. What else do you want to know about the Maple Leafs? Got any questions that you have? Maybe we can read them out and talk about them on the next show, perhaps. Let us know in the comment section down below. Uh, but for now, we'll uh, we'll leave it there. I'd like to thank you all for listening and supporting the show. You can subscribe to the Locked On Leafs podcast on all platforms, including uh, YouTube. You can receive that daily Leafs content. Follow myself on uh, X at Mickey underscore Canuck. Follow Dave at D underscore more suiting. Follow the show as well at Locked On Leaves. Go ahead, leave a like on this video if you enjoyed it. Comment down below on YouTube, and uh, we'll be back with another episode for you guys tomorrow. Until then, keep it locked right here on Locked On Leaves.